were the speed queens of the North Atlantic, racing across the ocean to break record after record. They were the wonders of their age, the largest, fastest, and most luxurious vessels ever built. Mighty triumphs of engineering, they had evolved from humble origins when men first crossed the ocean under steam. By the turn of the century, international competition had created even bigger and better ships, and finally, the first floating palaces. On their top decks, the darlings of society danced away the night, while in their steerage, thousands of immigrants endured a perilous crossing to America. Yet for all their service in peace, in war they too became victims. In the 1920s and 30s, the Atlantic Greyhounds returned to the ocean as glorious hotels and ships of state. And when a new war presents greater and more difficult problems on the Atlantic battlefield, it will inspire the great ships to serve their finest hour. Some will become legends in their time. This, then, is the continuing story of the great floating palaces of the North Atlantic. Queen Elizabeth II, flagship of the Cunard Line, the last ocean liner making regularly scheduled crossings of the North Atlantic. Tonight, her 1,400 passengers and crew of 1,000 are leaving New York for Southampton. When Cunard pioneered this service in 1840 with the Britannia, she carried 124 passengers and a crew of 13, about the capacity of one QE2 lifeboat. It is the QE-2's 999th crossing since her maiden voyage in 1969. Though she is the last of an era, she embodies the essence of many great liners before her. Tonight she seems a jewel set amidst the midnight lights of Manhattan. By 1920, the era of the ocean liner was in high gear. A world war had just ended, and the seas were safe once again. More people than ever were crossing the Atlantic. Posters and brochures emphasized romance, love, adventure, even the possibility of finding a mate. The immigrant trade, once a financial bonanza, was suddenly gone, a casualty of the Immigration Quota Act of 1921, and shipping companies had to attract a new kind of passenger, the American tourist. Instead of immigrants, budget-minded teachers and others began to travel in the newly created tourist class. What a way to go. Getting there is half the fun, which is what Kennard used to say. Even in tourist class, sitting in the dining room, uh, being pampered to a certain extent, uh, watching those horse races with those wooden horses, sitting out on deck and feeling the salt spray. It is the roaring 20s, and prohibition has become a new way of life for Americans. But at sea, once beyond the 12-mile limit, everyone has a drink. There are fewer ships on the Atlantic these days. The war has destroyed hundreds of merchant vessels and some of the greatest of the floating palaces. Sunk are Canard's Lusitania and White Star's Britannic. The entire German fleet is gone. Her most prized ships are now in the hands of those she once terrorized. The Imperator, once decorated with so much marble it listed to starboard, is now Canard's flagship, the Berengaria. Some of her rooms have been redone to reflect British taste, yet the ship's Teutonic essence is too ingrained to alter. It's unbelievable to me as a young boy of 14, you know, walk up the gangway, walk into the big state rooms and the ironer and the panelers and the 
beautiful restaurants and chandeliers. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Beautiful cutlery, the tables, the linens, the carpeting was terrific. You know, it was all first class. I mean, it's all new to me. The swimming pool was three decks high with columns, a Pompeian style pool. It was, uh, no ship had anything like this. If they had a pool at all, it was a single deck high. Here you are with a three deck high pool. Berengaria is the first Cunard ship to be named for a queen, the wife of Richard the Lionhearted. The Vaterland, the world's largest ship, became the American Leviathan at the outbreak of the war. The Leviathan was really 54,000 tons, but her designers, when they rebuilt her, made her be 59,000 tons by a bit of chicanery. However, that gave them the right to claim that she was the largest ship in the world. The Leviathan's peacetime conversion runs into a stumbling block when the Germans will not cooperate. They demand a million dollars for a copy of the blueprints. The American naval architect William Gibbs refuses and painstakingly figures it out himself. It takes nearly two years before she comes to sea. The Leviathan was known to millions because she was the biggest troop ship we had in World War I. Thousands and thousands of troops sailed over on her or came home on her. And so she was very, very special. No other ship had that status. Bismarck, under construction when war begins, is now White Star's majestic. Germans openly weep on the day it is handed over to her new owners, and the flag of the fatherland is lowered. The finest ships of the era have become the prizes of war. No new ships are launched for a decade. Britain and France have enough, Germany is in ruins. If the shipping companies are to survive, costs must be reduced. Ships are converted from coal to oil. No longer will buckets of coal be lifted hand over hand to fill the bunkers. Mileage is improved and fuel costs are reduced. Thousands of stokers, up to 350 men a ship, are dismissed. British ships of the Titanic class that survived the war are few. Yet the Olympic sister ship to Titanic still sails for White Star. Her William and Mary staircase is the centerpiece of her main salon. A poignant reminder of an identical and impressive structure that now rests at the bottom of the sea. The sensation was, God, I'm, I'm on the Titanic. I knew the stairway was exactly like the Titanic's. The main public rooms, the smoking room was almost identical. I'd grown up with pictures of the Titanic sinking and the interiors of the Titanic, and here I was walking on an identical sister ship. Olympic was never a fast ship. Her emphasis was luxury. In each of her rooms were some of the most stunning interiors ever built. The Olympic has much greater importance long after she's left service because of her connection to her sister Titanic than she did when she existed. She was rather forgotten in those days. She was a wonderful, reliable, comfortable ship, but she didn't have that certain Mauritania, Aquitania quality. Canard's Mauritania and Aquitania still rule the Atlantic. The Aquitania is acknowledged as one of the finest ships ever built. Her first-class menu, with apologies from the steward, advises that the motion of the ship precludes carrying the older wines. Her rooms show off the elegance of the Edwardian age. 
She is the first Cunarder with an indoor swimming pool, an electric elevator, and third-class accommodations. The Aquitania was so beautifully proportioned with her four magnificent stacks, raked mast, beautiful stern, and internally she had probably the most fabulous Edwardian decoration pre-World War I. The attraction to the Aquitania was like certain ships that came later and ships today. It's an undefiable electricity, a chemistry within a ship. Even some of the most beautiful ships haven't had it. They caress you. They you feel at home aboard them, no matter how elegant or how splendid. And the Aquitania had this quality that made people just love her dearly. It's a chemistry. She had fine lines, sailed like a lady, no problems with her stability, no problems with her, say, shipping water, and popular with the passengers, and certainly popular with the officers. Inside, of course, she was beautiful, deep wood paneling, beautiful pictures, but we all felt very proud to be on Aquitania. But if this era belongs to one ship, it is the Mauritania. The Mauritania, of course, is one of the great immortals. Four stacker, blue ribbon holder for 22 years, beloved, solid, reliable, served in World War I, um, went to, into cruising in the 30s, doing a dollar a day cruising in the Depression and so forth, uh, opening her bars to very thirsty Americans who were caught up in Prohibition. She had a wonderful, wonderful career that transcended several eras at one time. The Mauritania's interiors are exquisite. No two rooms are alike. The ship feels every bit an English manor house. Built in 1907, Mauritania is the champion of the 20s. Fast, beautiful, and among the largest of ships. A record-breaking voyage across the Atlantic is four days, 19 hours, at 26.16 knots on August 9, 1924. Yet, in time, she too will be obsolete, the victim of a new technology. It is the QE-2's first day at sea, on her return voyage home to Southampton. 85% of her passengers are Americans heading for Great Britain and Europe on holiday. It is a tradition born in the 1920s when ocean liners were the only way to cross. Many aboard the QE2 today would agree, but for different reason. If one is not in a hurry, the seaborne phrase, port out, starboard home, or posh, embodies the qualities that comprise the QE2. First cabin, the one closest to the bridge, costs $2,000 a night per person. As one travel writer reasoned, hotels can cost as much, but they can't provide the setting. Everything about the QE2 was once a major innovation many German in origin. The idea of a floating five-star restaurant emerged with that German shipping genius, Albert Ballon, at the turn of the century. As did the idea of a health spa aboard ship. But Germany's most important contributions had to do with the ship's speed. The Germans were the first to add an innovation called the bulbous bow to their liners. bulbous bow fills in where the water normally goes, the actual shape of the curve of the water when the bow of the ship passes through it. That shape is a bulb. If you have a knife-like prow without that shape, you have pieces, places of vacuum on either side which drag the ship back. In laboratories like Scotland's historic Denny tank, a model of a bulbous bow is tested before the real hull is built. Model hulls are carved from beeswax and then driven the length of this 100-meter tank. Data is analyzed, conclusions drawn. 
Though first used on warships, the Germans applied it to their next generation of liners after a proposal from an American admiral. In 1929, work is completed on the Bremen, a dramatic new German Greyhound built in the style of the new era. Rivets are replaced with plates that are welded together, a new ironworking technique developed during the war. The result is a smooth, sleek surface. There is nothing like her on the North Atlantic. In an industry obsessed with speed, these innovations would once again elevate Germany to master of the Atlantic. When the Bremen's bulbous bow is revealed at her launch, everyone is ready to copy. And for good reason. The new bow increases speed, reduces fuel consumption, and on her maiden voyage, enables the Bremen to strip the Atlantic speed record from the Mauritania. The Bremen was remarkable in that it was commissioned in 1929, 10 years or so after the Germans lost the First World War. And out of the ruins, they built the biggest and fastest liner in the world. Once on the water, the Bremen and her sister ship Europa render every other liner obsolete. Canard ships are no match. Bremen Europa were the first fast express steamers with the bulbous bow. Both were fast ships, both here gained the blue ribbon on their maiden voyages. They were really something exceptionally and absolutely new. The German ships embody the spirit of a new generation. The Bremen and Europa were sort of a German deco. They were long and sleek and had these squat stacks where they serpent-like looking. Inside, their modern interiors resonate with the prevailing German decor and design. The new Bauhaus style adorns each suite and public room, emphasizing the absence of ornamentation in favor of simple flat surfaces. Unlike Germany's previous floating palaces, which mimicked country houses and hotels, Bremen and the Europa look like ships. Impressed with the Europa, the author Thomas Wolfe described her as impregnated by the subtle perfume of thousands of beautiful and expensive women, alive with the silken undulance of their long backs, with the naked living velvet of their shoulders as they paced the decks at night. The Bremen and Europa are soon known as the Greyhounds of the Atlantic. They were launched on consecutive days in August 1928. Thousands watched as the shipbuilding cities of Bremen and Hamburg celebrated the birth of two great new ships. Not since the Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse and the Kaiser Wilhelm II at the turn of the century has Germany dominated the Atlantic. Now, 30 years later, she has returned to power on the shoulders of the Bremen and Europa. The Bremen sails from Bremerhaven on July 16, 1929. One observer calls her a cathedral of steel. But the great German Greyhound has a flaw. The short funnels spew soot over many a well-attired passenger. The squat stacks must be lengthened. Flaw or not, the Bremen quickly dethrones the Mauritania as the fastest ship in the world, crossing the Atlantic in less than four and a half days. The competition to be the fastest ship stretches into the present day. Here overlooking the River Thames in London is the Sea Containers Corporation. The company is the current holder of the Hales Trophy, an award created in 1934 to honor the fastest ship to cross the Atlantic. It is here, despite the protest of others, because in 1990, an ocean-going catamaran, not a passenger liner, crossed the Atlantic in three days, seven hours, and 54 minutes. But when the Hales Trophy was first awarded, 
the Atlantic was brimming with competition among ocean liners. The Hales Trophy was the idea of George Hales, a British Member of Parliament who immortalized himself in enamel and gold. And the time seems opportune and fitting for this abstract term, the blue ribbon of the Atlantic, to assume a more concrete form. Much like the space race of future decades, the Atlantic of the 1930s was a stage for competition among nations. 1934, the new Hales Trophy is first awarded to the Italian liner Rex. Rex is a masterpiece. Her interiors are full of Roman grandeur and Latin bravura. Two months later, she is joined by her sister ship, the Conte di Savoia. Both initiated by Italy's fascist dictator, Benito Mussolini. Mr. Mussolini wanted his share of the ocean liner pie, and so he produced the Rex and Conte de Savoia, the first super ships to sail from the Mediterranean rather than the northern route. The Rex is built in Genoa. She displaces 51,000 tons and is 96 feet wide, 879 feet long. Her quadruple screws are driven by steam turbines. She can carry 2,100 passengers. On August 1, 1931, King Victor Emmanuel III and Queen Elena join Premier Benito Mussolini to launch the Rex. embody Italy's finest artistry. To take advantage of the sunny southern route, passengers on the wrecks will be treated to an outdoor swimming pool. Inside the ship looks like a palazzo. The maiden voyage on the wrecks, <laughs> the engine broke down because they were not ready. Mussolini insisted that they sail on time. He made the railroads go on time and the ships would sail on time, even though they were not ready and they shouldn't have done it. So by the time they reached Gibraltar, the poor old wrecks had to stop and be repaired and all the passengers took trains over to Cherbourg or somewhere and went home on another vessel. The Countess of Savoia, again, she was not properly prepared. A cast iron porthole opening broke leaving a hole in the hull, something like four feet in diameter, and the ship nearly sank on her maiden voyage. Poor Italy. They had the most glorious ships under the sun, fine interiors, wonderful everything, and yet they were hung up by this idiot Mussolini. Despite the breakdown at sea on her maiden voyage, the Rex wins the new Hales Trophy. But by the time that it was actually the trophy had been made, the Rex had already lost the record to the Normandy. So Hales had a word with the directors of the French line and they came to some agreement that although they were now the holders, they would let the Rex, the, the Italians, hold the trophy for a month. Her companion ship, the Conte di Savoia, is built in Trieste. She weighs 48,000 tons and is 60 feet smaller. While the Rex is intended to be the new speed queen, the Conte di Savoia will be a magnificent tour de force of Italian art. Her glass doors and high ceilings usher in great showers of southern Mediterranean light. They were simply outstanding, wonderful liners. Every country wanted to have the biggest ship in the world. Every country wanted to have the fastest ship in the world. 
and every country wanted to have the most luxurious ship in the world. The race was on for national prestige. Ships of many nations join in the competition. Holland's New Amsterdam and Staten Island. Norway's Christian Afjord and Stavang Erfjord. From France, the SS France and Paris. Poland enters the fray with Batory and Pilsudski. The latter was built for Poland by Italy in exchange for coal as payment. But with the exception of the German-built Leviathan, now sailing under the American flag, the United States has no superliner of her own. It manifests itself in each country doing its level best to have a record breaker of one sort or another. Most beautiful, fastest, safest, uh, or all three of them. The Normandy is a perfect example of winning on all counts. Of all the countries to challenge the North Atlantic, France will make the boldest statement of all. The Normandy is destined to become one of the greatest ships of all time. It is QE2's second day at sea. Last night she passed Nantucket and is into her eastbound return from New York to Southampton. Icebergs in the North Atlantic keep the ship's route to the south until summer. A course correction made after the Titanic struck an iceberg and sank four days into her maiden voyage. Titanic's watery grave is marked at north latitude 41 degrees 46 minutes and west longitude 50 degrees 14 minutes. QE2 will pass the site at twilight. A reminder of the dangers of nature and the fragility of ships. The, the hull of this ship is immensely strong. She's 27 years old now. But she can run for another 27 years before the hull becomes anything like suspect. And underwater, because of uh, a change in design, she has thicker shell plating than I've seen in any merchant ship. I mean, she's not like a battleship, but she's built like one. No matter how strong or modern a ship, everyone either ends up on the bottom or at the breakers, rendered obsolete by a new generation. 1929, a new era begins. The Bremen is the world's fastest ship. She is a knot and a half faster than the former champion, the Mauritania. Next year, her sister ship, the Europa, will break her record. In 1933, another speed ship, the Rex, beats her German rivals. The era once dominated by the Mauritania is over. It is 1935, and Mauritania is about to be taken out of service. She is the oldest of the liners, one month short of 27 years, and for 22 of those years, she has held the blue riband. Still the favorite of many, she is simply out of date. In July, the Mauritania is bound for the scrap heap. Along the way, a generation weeps. On her last voyage, a merchant ship radios, goodbye, old girl. At the breakers, a piper plays a lament. Across the Atlantic in Washington, DC, writing as a private citizen, President Franklin Roosevelt calls it blasphemous that she should be sent to the breakers to become shot and shell for the next war. Granted she had been killed by public craving for needless swimming pools and private toilets, but why couldn't the British take her out to sea and sink her hull, giving her a Viking's funeral? For Roosevelt and many others, the end of the Mauritania is the end of an era. How 
could they scrap it? It was sacrilegious. When a ship dies, it's just like a person going. The entity of a ship, the fullness, the completeness, all the parts together are simply very different from each part separately. It is a living entity, a ship. Somehow, beauty never dies. In Bristol, England, a restaurant displays her 50-pound brass letters on its marquee. Inside, the Mauritania's famed Latvian oak panels now line the dining room. Her graceful craftsmanship will touch a generation that has never gone to sea in a liner. Here, one can still feel the beauty of a great ship. And at England's famous Pinewood Film Studios, Mauritania's library is now the company's boardroom. Pinewood's founder, J. Arthur Rank, said there were just too many good memories to see it lost forever. Like Franklin Roosevelt, he too enjoyed the smell of tobacco, oil, and cognac embedded in the hand-carved woods. While pieces of the Mauritania are sold at auction, the French stun the world with the sleek lines of a radical new bow. It disdains the bulbous shape in favor of a clipper one. Nevertheless, she will be fast because fuel efficient or not, the French will equip her with the world's most powerful engines. She is the Normandy, the 1928 creation of Jean d'Alpiaz, president of the French line, where prestige is a matter of policy. When asked if the Normandy is sister ship to another liner, d'Alpiaz replies, the purpose of life is to create, not to copy. The Normandy was the ultimate ship of its time. It cost a whopping $60 million in the 30s, which is probably four or 500 billion in today's money. The French put every ingredient that symbolized France in that ship technologically, but more importantly, decoratively. Orbison, Lalique, hammered glass, bronze, paintings, you name it. She was to be the supreme symbol of all that was France. Externally, she was an extremely modern ship. She had a wonderful, magical quality of what almost every little boy's vision of a big liner should look like. Three huge smokestacks, sleek, futuristic, beautifully proportioned. And then, of course, when you went aboard, she was a combination of the Hollywood set the great skyscraper, the Grand Hotel, all woven into one. She was truly the ship of its time, the, the ultimate liner, the, the composite of all other ships. The press calls the Normandy the new wonder of the world, the Adonis of the seas, the vessel of light. She is a floating museum of contemporary French art. The muses, if they travel with any ship, surely travel with her. In her 380-seat theater, movies premiere with their stars in the audience. An evening on the Normandy, I'm imagining it, elegantly dressed women in the finest Parisian fashions, the big names are there, Pateau and so forth, with trains. Men looking like William Powell and Cary Grant with tails. Everyone sort of leisurely smoking cigarettes in long holders. Strains of Cole Porter and Irving Berlin being played. You expected Fred and Ginger to just sweep by cheek to cheek to finish up the ambiance. And at the same time, you're on this wonderful maritime temple that's moving at gigantic speed and delivering you in a few days to England or France. How extraordinary. You weren't just in some hotel, the Plaza of the Waldorf. You were on a great moving vehicle that was a sumptuous palace inside. She weighs a record-breaking 80,000 tons. Her length is 1,029 feet. She is 119 feet wide. The Normandy is so large, the port of Le Havre must be dredged to accommodate her. The outer jetty widened an additional 300 feet. Normandy's hull design is revolutionary. Unlike the straight stem of the Mauritania or the Bremen's bulbous bow, hers is a clipper shape, graceful, angular, sleek. 
The master of the Normandy is Captain René Punier. He will take her from Le Havre to New York on her maiden voyage in May 1935. By the end of the crossing, Normandy is flying a 40-foot-long blue riband. She is the first ship ever to fly a real blue pennant. She sets a new speed record, and like the Rex and the Bremen before her, she is honored with the Hales Trophy. Any good company, for example, when they're envisioning the Blue Ribbon, will never come out and say the maiden trip will be the Blue Ribbon trip. There's too much risk. Anything could happen. The French were evidently quite confident that, although they didn't say the Normandy would try for the Blue Ribbon, that when she got to New York, she had, in fact, captured it from the wrecks. Every passenger was given a commemorative medallion commemorating the capturing of the Blue Ribbon. And so you'd say to yourself, was it struck on board down below? And as you looked closely at the medallion, on the very bottom in fine lettering, it said made in France. The French were so confident that the ship would succeed, that they almost ran away with themselves and had things manufactured and ready to celebrate this magnificent liner that they had built. She was described to me by a friend as being a ship that smelt of expensive French perfume and cigarettes. She was just the great Hollywood set, set on water. In 1935, the Normandy is the newest floating palace on the North Atlantic. Yet she never makes a profit. The Normandy averages only half her capacity. Some say her opulent interiors intimidate all but the most confident passengers. Even so, to her rivals in Britain, the future course is clear. They must create a ship to match her. In Glasgow, the keel is laid for the next great Atlantic challenger. She will help rescue Britain from economic collapse and the world from the tyranny of fascism. She is known only as Hull 534. The QE2 is nearing the midpoint of her 2,900 mile return to Southampton. Today, on this vast ocean, she is a solitary sojourner. In another era, the QE2 would have had a sister ship, as the Mauritania had the Lusitania, and Bremen had the Europa, when profits could support a fleet of ships on the North Atlantic. Between 1920 and the start of the Second World War, dozens of ships crossed this ocean. Their passengers engaged in the same rituals, a morning walk, tea at four, a formal reception. One great ship of the 30s catches the imagination of her age. Quite remarkably, she lives today and is still in service though not a service on the high seas. She is a ship for all time. She is the Queen Mary. Now more than 60 years after her maiden voyage, she endures. Although every one of her kind has gone to the breakers or rests at the bottom of the sea. The Queen Mary is a museum now and a floating hotel. Guests still come from around the world to stay and visit. of history still very much alive, evoking so many feelings from those lucky enough to have been aboard when she was in her prime. 
we realized that she was just, this was a gargantuan ship. It was just awe-inspiring. Morning, I was called at 6.30. I had to scrub a floor. This was my job every morning, except Sundays. Coming back has touched so, so many memories. Uh, and, and every sense of sight and sound and, and smell. And it's very, very difficult to describe. This was like a dream come true when I was 17 years old. This was coming on this ship. That whistle could be heard for 10 miles. It was a very deep-throated roar. The best whistle I ever heard. The story of the Queen Mary begins on the banks of the River Clyde. It was a wonderful launch. Oh, yes. Wonderful launch. So 60,000 tons of steel into water. That day, I stood alongside halfway down the berth. Yeah. You were underneath the boat. I was under the bow, yes. We had to take out the last four blocks. That's right. Before it went away down. We had a good view of King George and Queen Mary that uh, day. Oh, Tremendous uh, crowd. There was thousands of people big watching, platforms, you know. specially arranged platforms for the the public. Yes. The king was not in the best of health and in order to protect them we boxed it in in glass screens. They dropped the triggers. Queen pressed a switch on the platform. It started moving right away. It started moving right away. And when the ship went into the water it threw up a great wave and all that ground was flooded yeah. and these people got their feet slightly wet. They all get wet. swamped. <laughs> they, all get, they all get swamped. But they had to borrow what all the chains from all the yards up and down the clay. Right, yes. You know, to hold her back and skin the river. Something all the like chains tightened up and held her and finished up right in the middle of the river. Right in the middle of the river. Never see it again. No. Today on the River Clyde, there are more memories than ships. Clyde Banks Town Hall is no longer a meeting place for the likes of Lord Kelvin and Ernest Cunard. Ships are still built here, but they are very different kinds of ships. In 1931, desperate to compete with the Normandy and Bremen, Cunard comes to Clyde Bank to build their newest and best ship ever. She is designated Hull 534. One of the naval architects charged with constructing the world's largest ship was John Brown. You must check that the strength of the hull will be adequate. You must test the powering, the layout of the public rooms and the accommodation. It's up to the naval architect to develop them and fit them into the hull. But shortly after the hull goes up, the ship falls victim to the Great Depression. All work is stopped. 6,000 shipbuilders are out of work. I remember very clearly the day when they stopped their work. That was at the end of 1931. Clydebank was a very lively place until the stoppage. The heart was taken out of it. At the John Brown shipyard, Hull 534 rusts away symbol of a desperate nation. Finally, after two years, the government acts. The men of Clyde Bank march down the streets of Glasgow to the sound of bagpipes and the cheers of their families. begins again. She was something very special at Clyde Bank, you know. She'd represented 
work and security at a time when there was very little work about, when we were, we were going through the biggest slump we've ever had in this country, far bigger than the one we've got now. And she was regarded at that time as a national symbol of the recovery of Britain. It is time for 534 to have a name. Canard selects one ending in IA, as they always had, from Britannia to the Berengaria. But this time, fate has other plans. The two top people in Cunard went to see George V, and they had intended to name her Victoria. And they said, we, are, we wish to name her after England's greatest queen. And without blushing or batting an eyelash, good old George V said, my wife would be delighted. I am happy who named this ship the Queen Mary. The ship weighs 81,235 tons and is 1,018 feet long and 118 feet wide. She is larger than the Normandy, but will she be faster? Within a year, the Queen Mary is fitted out to regal splendor. The new ship is as beautiful as Cunard can fashion her. No cost-cutting or plain wood here. From every country in the empire come the woods to decorate her staterooms and suites. When we left Clyde Bank, there were many moist eyes because they were very sorry to see her go. She had represented a lot of work to Clyde Siders. Amazingly, the Queen Mary nearly meets her end before she ever reaches the sea. When we went down the Clyde, well, she very nearly came to grief. One of the tugs that had come up from Southampton didn't get hold of a hawser quick enough, and her nose touched the mud. And the tide was sluicing out, and her stern swung round and went on the mud on the other side of the river. And for a few agonizing minutes, we were right across the river, and she heeled right over. Unfortunately, the pilot never lost his cool, and he got her off. But they told us afterwards that had she stayed there for 20 minutes, she would have been a total loss. She would have broken her back and had to have been cut into two and, and towed away. And during that time, which would have taken six months, she would have completely blocked the whole port of Glasgow. The Queen Mary is a worthy rival to the Normandy, Bremen, Europa and Rex. She displaces 2,000 tons more than the Normandy, making her the largest ship afloat. But critics from other countries call her dull in exterior design. A typical Clyde-built ship, an overgrown Aquitania, bulkier. Ironically, the man who designed Normandy had first approached Cunard with his design for a clipper-shaped hull. But the British declined. Not ship-like, they thought. But the Queen Mary does indeed capture the Atlantic speed record from Normandy in August 1935, just months after her maiden voyage, to become the undisputed champion of the Atlantic. She also becomes the favorite of the rich and famous. Four years she crosses in a virtual state of grace. But the gaiety and laughter will soon fade into the shadows of another war. The peril of this trip was war was on its way and we were told, I don't remember seeing these ships, but we were told that the Europa was ahead and the Bremen was behind or vice versa. They were both armed and they were German ships. And we raced. It was incredibly rough. And I remember hearing that the ship, in fact, broke her own speed record. Had war been declared while we were actually doing this last 
um, west to east crossing in peacetime, this ship would have been blown straight out of the water. As the summer of 1939 comes to an end, the Queen Mary is about to begin the most important chapter of her young life. <laughs>